I work with assemblage really. I use a lot of found objects. In the title, which is the susurrus of the whispering and rustling of, of people, places and things. I thought, susurrus, it sounds so beautiful. And I looked it up and it meant the whispering and the rustling. And I thought, well, that's exactly what my work is about. And now that I live in the Blue Mountains, I'm finding objects that relate to this place. But in the exhibition, there are many resonances with other places and other people. My mom is a tailor, and so I was the youngest of four children. And so when they were all at school even, I'd be at home and my mom would be sewing. So I would sit at the foot of the treadle. I think maybe that's what gave me the interest in these sort of rhythmic structures, you know, the sound of that treadle sewing machine. And I um, got really fascinated by the way that you would have a pattern and this flat pattern would turn into a three-dimensional thing, you know? It was magical. It's a magical thing to, to watch her make these garments. And that was wonderful, you know? I'd always thought that sculpture had to be bronze or marble or something, and I thought, no, not at all. Yeah, that's where I began. I was interested in painting, but then I started to make three-dimensional work out of fabric. And then from that, I made tents, and they were like these lovely transparent shapes. And that theme has continued through. <laughs> I like all the things that people use. If you look around, I mean, there, there are all these things that involve bodily action. Utensils, tools for working in the garden. This is called Angels and Insects, which is actually the title of a book by A.S. Byatt. But I made this work originally in Korea, and I got the implements from the local market. This one. And some of them are actually one piece of metal that's been formed into the shape. They're beautiful things. It's called Angels and Insects because I made these tools thinking about the possibility of good things coming out of this rather than bad things, so angels. And I, they have these long transparent handles because the angels are actually going to use these tools to plant things in the ground. And of course, as soon as you plant things, you get insects. I want people to see the kind of sculpture in these objects, you know? They're so beautiful. Mm. The things I have in the studio, in the glass cases, it's like a little museum, really. And they are my sketch pad. And I look at them and from that will come a work, a transformation, or will feed into a work. The longer you look at them, the narratives begin in relation to those objects. I make still lives, really, to be honest. I call it a kind of portraiture of a place or a person or even an object. You could maybe say portrait by attribute. So there isn't necessarily a picture of the person at all, but the objects that relate to the person and that have special meaning for the person. And some of them, like the combs, which are so beautiful, I just work with the shape and maybe transform it in terms of size. Yeah, this is called Alice's comb. But sometimes 
I like to make things strange. So this time the comb became gigantic. But Alice became gigantic, you know, like her arm went up the chimney and her head out the window. So it's a comb when she was gigantic. May not look necessarily exactly like the initial plan, but as long as it, it works, as long as it's got some kind of authenticity. Constructed memories and constructed cities were made in Beijing with my friend Alan Chorna. I interviewed people and then I made assemblages and Alan took the photos. We made two books. We made one about the memories of where they lived before, which tell you a lot about them. And then we made one about what it was like to be in Beijing. I remember Beijing was a Beijing of coal burning, of winter cabbages and carts with horses. The skin of Beijing has changed. It has become a skyscraper city, but the body is the same. You look under the surface and the history of China is there, a city impregnated with politics and culture. I will always remain an outsider as I cannot read the codes. I have no urge to leave, but it is not my city. Here, though, I have space to think, space to challenge, take risks, to be. When I look at this cabbage, I look at the intricate pattern of the cabbage, and, and there's a similar kind of, it's like a tree. It's, it's a beautiful thing, a beautiful pattern, a circular pattern. And I put it on the yellow cloth, the yellow and the purple. It's yellow silk, so there was a, a slightly ceremonial um, response to Jane and her history, and the beauty of the cabbage, really. Beijing has changed in the 10 years since I was here, and I realize I have changed too. When you come to a new place, you have no ancestors or territory, and you start again like a child. It has been really nice to be open to experience like a child, so I have changed again. I feel safe here. If I did not feel safe, I am afraid and I cannot work. I was born in a house that does not stand there anymore. I remember looking out of the window and you could see the harbour, the boats coming and going. I remember winter time. It was cold. I had red knees and legs from the cold because I wore short trousers. So the red apples are for his knees. And this is, though it's a Chinese, I was thinking of Delft China, you know, the blue and white China from Holland. I like the apples though. So. They're looking at you. Now you could go and stand in the spot, in the zone. One of the most recent works was making a feather coat for my husband, Tony. Partly came about because four of my neighbors, surrounding neighbors, lost their chickens to foxes. Very good. The feathers were too good not to use, and to a certain extent, it's a, a memento to my neighbor's chickens. The coat is, is very similar in design to some of the coats I saw in museums in China, the pattern. So I plonked him on the, the Great Wall of China wearing this coat. And then it, it wasn't enough, he needed the head as well. You couldn't tell it's him anymore though, but he's a very obliging man. You know, he just has to put up with being a model occasionally. An ongoing theme throughout my work has been the creation of habitations. What people do to make a space their own. It's really interesting to see how people will transform a room and it will become theirs, you know? China tea. So it, it's about people's ownership of, of their own beauty in a way. Objects are like novels. And for me, making a work, the joy of it as it appears is like writing a book. I begin to get all these other resonances with the way that the work is appearing before me.
um, I'm a bit of a residency person, and I went to Paris um, to the Musée des Arts et Métiers, where you've also been, and um, I saw this amazing loom. And as you've seen already from the studio, I'm very interested in objects and handworking and so on. And I thought, oh, I have to come back to this place. So I got a residency, oops, wrong way. I got a residency at the Cité, and I, at the Musée, I, uh, I, I met, met a, metaphorically speaking, Monsieur Jacquard, um, who invented punch card technology, okay? And here's a Jacquard loom with the punch cards. Um, and I thought, I have to go further with this. It's an amazing place. You have to go there. All of you. Now. <laughs> um, and I, I kept going with this research. And I came across Ada Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron. Did you know he had a daughter? Mm -hmm. yeah, the only legitimate daughter, actually. <laughs> um, they had many other children. And she was an incredible woman. Um, she was brilliant. And she worked with Babbage um, to invent the first calculator, the analytical engine, which is so much like a name, isn't it? I think so. Um, using punch card technology. And, um, wondrously, she, she began to understand that this technology could be used to generate music, to make music. And, oh, I had to put that cartoon in, because it, it, they never made the analytical engine, it never actually happened. And it was, a, you know, a, very cynical about it, but it was there, it was the beginning of that. And, I moved, I skipped a bit here, and I married Ada to, to Alan Turing, which neither of them would have liked. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely wouldn't have happened. But he was the first, apart from many things that he did, he cracked the Enigma code, um, and he got in a lot of trouble for his sexuality. Um, wonderful man. But towards the end of his life, which wasn't long, he became interested in plant morphology. Um, but he also um, made the first computer-generated music. And do you know what he did? He played Bar Bar Black Sheep. <laughs> <laughs> so disappointing, really, isn't it? But um, towards the end of his life, he became interested in plant morphology. And I've spelt that wrong. I'm so sorry. And there's a little bit of, um, you can't, you all know about Fibonacci, don't you? So he, he um, even now, in Manchester, England, there's a whole department that has got families in uh, Manchester growing sunflowers and counting the seeds. And um, so it continued out of that. I, I, you can't read all of that, it's too much. So I, I really did. Uh, combined, there's Alan and Ada, and in the middle is Monsieur Jacquard's punch cards. And for Alan, um, you saw on the video, I was sewing, I made this uh, Fibonacci spiral by sewing pieces of cedar and black buttons with copper wire, and made a Fibonacci spiral. And coming out of the spiral were these um, ribbons, which joined up with Ada. So they became a couple. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, keep doing that. There it is. <coughs> it was a labor of love. I said to my husband, who you've already met, um, oh, I'd take a couple of weeks, like, you know, two months later, three months later, but it was a labor of love. It was worth it. And um, I also became very intrigued with the jackpot cards. So there they are. And Leading on from that, I came across Hedy Lamar, the most beautiful woman in the world at the time, it was said. And she said, my face is my misfortune, because she was incredibly smart. And she invented, um, with um, Georges and Thiel, a bizarre couple really, another strange couple. Um, they invented um, a, a, a radio guidance system for allied, allied torpedoes that used a code stood on back to punch card technology and it was to um, assist the American submarines in the Second World War in terms of avoiding you know, being shot. 
and it's still continuing. Uh, and Lamar also studied um, the aerodynamics of birds and the shapes of fish. So she was also interested in its plant morphology and this connection between uh, biology and um, so much invention, so much possibility that comes out of those organic shapes. Um, and George had, had been working with um, Monsieur Leger on the ballet mechanique. I'm sure I just go back on that one a little bit. There he is, the ballet mechanique. So it's another combination of, of music using, he used uh, player pianos. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I can see you nodding, you know about this, yeah. And so I'm, I'm now, oh, so I just little, made a little work for George. Where is the music, Monsieur Antille? Because he was making the music for the Ballet Mechanique, and he just did it, he didn't deliver on time. <laughs> so where is it, Monsieur Antille? So that's a, a, a recent work coming out of this system. And there's variations of it, because I, I play with the materials. And I played, I mean, that's obviously a reference to Leisure. Sorry. Oh, I'm doing it again. Sorry. At least you get to see things twice. <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget. And this is another recent work, um, Weights and Measures, just small works. On the side of these are, are rulers that I found in Japan. So and there's a weight. And the measures relates to music. And in the background, just... Behind there is uh, some of the music from the Ballet Mechanique. Wait, some measures, that one's from China. We've been to similar places, you know. I'm coming to your house. <laughs> <laughs> and these are just small works thinking about these people because I'm, I'm moving forward again. These are just small works thinking. This is like my brain thinking. I mean, I, there's nothing to be said. It's what I'm thinking about, you know. Um, and so Ada's feathers and flowers, Alan's sunflowers, and Hedy's fish and wings led me to oh no, mm -hmm. Humboldt. I suddenly went backwards in time because this thing is not new. This idea and Humboldt, um, his, he wanted to measure the world, and it's got to be the title for a show, measuring the world. Here he is, gorgeous Mr. Humboldt, and I, I can't attach him to anybody because there was nobody. He was just a chap with another chap, <laughs> adventuring. And he'd made these marvellous maps. He'd measured the world. He adventured. Um, he, they're in relation to um, climate and altitude. The vegetation is in relation to... I think he should make a tapestry. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> else knows. <laughs> it's not going to be me. <laughs> but look at his drawings. So measuring the world. So I decided that... Humboldt has got to be there, and then we come forward, um, and I want to return to Turing, because he believed, he believed in the possibility of, of so much in, in his short life, um, and from Turing, so I'm going to do another work about Turing, maybe here, but I think I'm only going to make small maquettes here, because, you know, I'm not in my studio. And I'm going to probably move to Timothy Morton and the idea of hyper-objects, because he also has come out of music, and quite an interesting man, music and creativity. All of these guys, uh, not all of them, but um, crucially, the relations between Buddhism and science, nature and culture, are examined in the fusion of a single vision, the result is a great work of cognitive mapping, both exciting and, unif and, and useful. So I want to go from the past mapping and, and take it right through to this idea of hyper-objects. And I have got a partner for him, Joyce Hinterdy. But I've only just sort of got to her about a week ago, so um, we'll see what happens with Joyce, and I haven't even asked her. And she's alive and lives in Sydney, so... <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, these ideas and images are taking me somewhere. And thank God for that. I don't know <laughs> what it's going to be. 
and perhaps something will come out of being here. I like arriving in places with nothing and seeing what happens. Thank you.